Thank you for having us today. Can I start by asking you about Woodford Academy? It's had a very mixed history and can you tell us a little bit about the site and how it became a museum here in the Blue Mountains? You should start that one. You think I should start that one? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, the Woodford Academy is the Blue Mountains oldest building. It was bequested um, by the final owner, um, Gertrude McManamy, to the National Trust in 1979. Um, it is not your classic grand manor in any way, shape or form. It um, began its life as a fairly humble roadside inn and grew over the years. Um, it had moments of um, almost becoming um, glamorous in the um, late 1880s. It was actually one of the first guest houses in the mountains um, under the poor nephew of the Fairfax dynasty, <laughs> Alfred Fairfax. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it, it, it's changed from it's been a pub, it's been a, a guest house, it's been a private residence, it's been a school. Mm. Um, I guess in terms of like, I moved to the Blue Mountains 12 years ago, and when I first came up here, it was still very much the old National Trust property run by some little old ladies in a real mixture of furniture and um, mm. and and then I didn't get involved again until I met Liv, so <laughs> she can tell you about how it became. Yeah, so now. for a national property, a, a national trust property, you, um, you actually run quite uh, non-traditional public programs and contemporary art exhibitions. So, how did that approach begin, and how did you both become involved in the uh, in, man, in the management committee of? of um... Yeah, so when I became involved, um, the national trust were looking at divesting the property from their property portfolio. Um, it had struggled to attract any visitation, despite being on the major route. Everyone knew the building. Um, we'd driven past it for 30 years, is the classic statement, but never come in. Um, we did note that the people that had attended the property had attended because they had come for an event, whether it was a book sale or something. So we thought, right, we need some triggers to actually get people through the door. Once they come through the door, they discover what an amazing building it is. Um, but we really need to create some attractors. Um, I had done some work with a um, online design scene up here called the Cloudscape, and through that I'd been interviewing a number of um, local artists and contemporary artists in the Blue Mountains. So I knew that we had fertile ground here in terms of some incredible artists who really didn't have anywhere at that stage local to show. Um, and that was how I met Jacqueline as well. Um, so we decided that in lieu of any sort of formal heritage interpretation to the property, that what we would do instead was invite the artists to do site-specific works um, at the property. So that was... Come on, it was selfish reasons, wasn't it? It was selfish reasons. It was because I wanted coffee and contemporary art within the walking <laughs> distance of my home. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, starved for culture. So bring it to us, make our own fun. And that is my idea of fun. So, um, so we put the word out to the people that I knew in that first year. And the response was incredible. Um, we were just incredibly grateful that we had this um, support from the artistic community, especially when they heard the story that we were struggling to stay open to the public. Um, so Jacqueline was one of the first artists to exhibit in that first year. Mm -hmm. um, and each and every exhibition just showed us what a wealth of um, inspiration this property had. And it had multiple stories to tell, many of them unknown. Mm -hmm. And it just keeps it just keeps going. Like even the last exhibition that um, we mentioned, the Explorers exhibition, you think after how many artists was it? Ninety artists yes, has been through. Almost ninety artists exhibited that, um, in the last four years. That it would get repetitive, but every single time there's something new and different. And I think that's what that's what ignited my interest. First of all, it was it's a it was a blank slate in terms of an artist. You could come in and do anything you wanted. You didn't have any restrictions that you might have in a historic house mm -hmm. that has, you know, a collection that's set up and mm -hmm. recorded and all that sort of thing. So it was just, you know, really a lot of freedom. And then um, and then just seeing what other artists kept bringing to the table time and time mm -hmm. again and other curators, it was, and it still is, there's just, mm -hmm. there's so many, there's such a rich history here. And do you think you've kind of been a catalyst then in creating that, uh, growing that sense of community in the art scene here in the mountains? Yeah. I think it wasn't just what was happening here, there was sort of a groundswell occurring yeah, anyway. Yeah, so yeah. the Cloudscape had started off as trying to sort of bring that community together. Um, since then, um, our council's um, got an entity called BME, which um, has created a branding for creating industry in the mountains called Mountains Made, and that's yet another aspect of what's going on. That's been a bit more recently. We also had yeah. some other art projects, independent art projects that happened here. And, um, and that's certainly um, modern art projects 
they definitely started to bring together some of the some of the artists that weren't appearing in other spaces mm -hmm. around the mountains because they were more traditional spaces. And then we had the um, the scenic world sculpture mm -hmm. exhibition um, that also brought a lot of a lot of things happened at the same time. Yeah. And, I think, and also there's just the general. Um, move from Sydney because of housing prices and artists always go first, <laughs> you know, because we're the ones that can least afford to live. Um, and see potential in places too. Yeah. And I think there was a lot of, you know, potential that, you know, we all, there was you know, a number of people in our generation who moved here about the same mm. time. Mm. We all kind of found each other and then, yes, as I said, our idea of fun is Know, contemporary arts. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, clearly you know, your management committee is, is much more youthful than what you would normally see in a, in a historic property, uh, mm. perhaps of, of a similar nature. Mm. Um, how, how did that, uh, how did you, how, how did that come about, do you think? Uh, well, again, we... I think it was actually quite organic. It was really once we discovered this place and you know saw that it had huge potential, incredible stories to tell, stories that were pretty unknown really, despite yeah. being the oldest thing in the mountains, <laughs> the oldest building, which is quite incredible. So um, there was just a number of us who came together and we thought, no, we can see what we can do with this. And we wrote a new business plan and put that to the National Trust. Um, yes, we didn't have constraints. I wasn't particularly interested in doing, you know, traditional exhibitions and just providing an exhibition space. I really did mm. want to encourage artists to start to tell those stories. So site specific was really important. That was, in fact, the only brief to the artists in terms mm. of like, exhibiting here. They needed to be local and it needed to be site specific. So how they responded to or what story they chose to tell was is a never ending thing. Yeah. But but Liv's also being a bit modest there because I think. Um, the people that came onto the management committee very much worked with the people that were already here and had a sense of, and gave them a sense of ownership of it as well. I don't think you could just do a takeover in that way, and I think that's reflected in that in the program. It's been consciously not curated so that it can appeal to a very broad spectrum of audiences. So you have everything from, you know, very, um, you know, uh, eclectic group exhibitions of knitting and crochet and mm. all sorts of things with some really fantastic contemporary art and I think that's really important. I think it would be very sad if it ever got to the point where it just became a very controlled curated space for one particular audience um, and I think the management committee have been able to really um, give the community space to own it as well mm. and it wouldn't happen without those two elements you know and mm. I think that's what's made it a success it's not something that you could right. necessarily replicate somewhere else it was a I think everyone has right people and a sense of ownership over it too mm. so you know each artist that exhibit here you know we have a lot of our volunteers talk about this as their second home there is a lot of ownership community ownership yeah. of this building which is really unique and interesting and yeah. part of what makes it kick along <laughs> and today we're actually in in one of the uh, part of the artist studios that are run here as well uh, how, do, how do they operate uh, so they're essentially tenancies so we identified as part of our business plan that we needed um, the 12 open days so we open once a month um, was probably not enough to sustain the building in terms of the conservation budget. Mm. Um, so we thought that if we could, this space has its own separate entry, etc. It wasn't really adding much to the visitor experience because it's quite separate, it's upstairs. Um, that if we could uh, lease those spaces, um, that we would get a ground level of um, financial sustainability to the property. Um, so we put the word out that as well and because of the cultural program the response was actually from the artistic community which was great so we have had um because there, there are no um supported spaces in the mountains for artists there are no artist studios between here and Parramatta, which is why i also set up lawson for the same reason mm. it's just so having a space to create and yeah so so they responded they which responded. was great and so the studio we're sitting in now is um owned by caitlin hughes who runs Hughes Studio. She's a mosaic artist, but she engages a number of other tutors who do traditional oil painting and all sorts of things um, for both adults and children. Mm -hmm. So there's a steady stream of people. She often has international artists doing guest um, tutoring as workshops as well, which is great. And she was a teacher she up here at one of the, teacher. the schools. And so she's she's brought in, again, she brings in a lot of people who come in to do you know, for workshops. They might drive up from Sydney, but it's it's that constant building of, actually building of the audience in the same mm. way that the history is layered. It's mm. layering of that audience and 
There's also historic talks and dinners mm. and ghost tours and things. So the program is actually a little bit of old, a little bit of new, yeah. and keeping a lot of getting a lot of buy-in from the community, from all parts of the community. So we were expansive, not exclusive. So and a cafe, <laughs> and a cafe yes. yeah. Very good cake. We're actually all we did the cake in the mouth. <laughs> But so some of the other artists that we've had through here, um, uh, our florist has just moved out, she's a floral artist, um, and we had a milliner here as well who have both gone on to then set up their own um, stores elsewhere, one in Katoomba and one in Wentworth Falls. That was Edith... Um, Edith Pass from Floral. And Christine... Christine Thompson? Thompson. From Christine's, from Christine's millinery. millinery. So Christine does lots of um, costuming um, hats and things for operas and all sorts of things. Mm. So. And now there's been a few more spaces, a little few more spaces that have uh, galleries that have little studio spaces that have studio. popped up. And now there is actually Naughty Studios up in Hazelbrook, which is, um, I think they have a studio in, in Sydney as well, mm -hmm. which is artist spaces to rent. So definitely I think... Um, they saw what the possibility. Mm -hmm. It was interesting when we first put that to the National Trust, that was the um, one part of the business plan that got the most um, resistance. Um, they didn't really understand how that could work. Um, my husband um, ran music studios in the city for you know, decades. <laughs> so we were very conscious of the fact that, you know, what you can do with the space and how artists occupy them, um, that that could be a really positive thing to add into the mix of what was happening here at the Academy. Um, and all of those artists have um, exhibited at the Academy as well. So the um, Christine did a, a, a wonderful um, historical hat parade <laughs> and um, Edith did an amazing um, floral installation in the um, grand dining room downstairs that was that was allowed to decay and she worked with a mm -hmm. local photographer on that one as well. And that's been shown at Hawkesbury Regional Gallery. It's currently on um, display at the um, Cultural Centre, or she's exhibiting at the Cultural Centre currently. So we've been really pleased to then sort of strengthen those ties with mm -hmm. the Blue Mountains Cultural Centre as well. So the um, exhibitions manager from that has attended a number of our shows and has, that has allowed her a way to engage with those artists. Mm. So I always talked about it is that we never really wanted to be the main event. We're not in Kachimba, we're not in the main centre, we're not a known factor. But I, I always like fringe. <laughs> <laughs> we can do fringe really well. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, we are. And fringe. it has, it's, it's been a sort of... Yeah, mm. And the fact that we're central mountains, I was saying before, you know, the upper mountains and the lower mountains, there's always this kind of... The upper mountains thinks the lower mountains are Sydney. The lower mountains thinks the upper mountains. It gets all the funding, and the centre, the centre of the mountains is kind of like the middle child. We just get on with it. <laughs> we do. We make our own fun. Yeah. So yeah. it's um, we've become a nice link actually between. Yeah. So it was quite a conscious thing to try and foster a cultural activity mm. here and become a cultural hub because we saw that the community was crying out for it really. And also, we've leveraged off each other's professional lives. So. Um, Liv is an architect and has been a lot of um, has been involved quite actively on the site in terms of the um, conservation and management plan and all mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Um, I've worked for the Dictionary of Sydney, so it's a, an online history of Sydney. So through that, I had a lot of contact with historians who've ended up writing about the history of the academy, and that's mm -hmm. now online and in, at the State Library and published. Um, we've got Kate, who's at the Opera House, and the Opera House when they closed. Um, to renovate, they allowed their staff to go and do paid volunteer work somewhere. So thanks to the Opera House, we actually had cake for one day a month. One day a month, for five months, I think it was. It was great. And it was she's the closest we ever had to yeah. an employee. So just a performing <laughs> arts background. So everybody, and so that brings we kind of that brings a network of different people mm -hmm. in with different interests who who mm -hmm. have thought about how to use the space in creative ways and. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah it's and it hasn't negated any of the other sort of traditional programs mm. of the National Trust either. So as a, we've got a number of retired teachers on our um, management committee yeah. um, and they run the, the education program. So they've brought it up to scratch the um, New South Wales syllabus and um, we have school tours come through here. And, you know, and you've got funding for the World War One. Yep, and so the, the historians are working on a number of the schoolboys who um, went to the school in the early 1900s, went on to serve in World War One. so as part of the centenary of World War One, there's been a program going on um, that's telling those stories of those boys and where they ended up, which was, um, it's been great, that's been supported by a number of grants as well, so. Yeah, it was really, um, really quite a diverse... Uh, yes. <laughs> that I'm we just, embrace. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering what the challenges are 
for you as a museum in a sense then beyond the contemporary arts so what are the sustainability yeah volunteer sustainability is our biggest challenge we really so got to the point where the current management committee have really put in a lot of extra hours a lot of extra time mm. and they've given away their weekends and, their, and everything i mean i haven't been involved anywhere near as much as the rest of them and they, we need we need a paid role paid position here mm to keep it sustainable and we need, yeah. And that's something we've been working with in discussions with the National Trust for quite a long time now. Mm -hmm. um, we're very conscious that there was so far that we could take it in terms of how much time and effort people can do in a volunteer capacity. We see that the property still has huge potential to really cement its, its place in this community, but mm -hmm. to do that it really needs employment. Um, we have now got, there's a new um, properties manager who's now in charge of seven <laughs> volunteer managed properties so her time is rather limited but at least it's a start so she's here mm. two days a month now which is great so even just opening the doors to let tradesmen in or do maintenance or whatever it is it's, we realized when kate was working here last year just to have one day that we knew someone was there and no one had to stop working or <laughs> do something else to come and open up it was mm. great so that's something we're going to continue discussions with the National Trust about. I think there's a huge opportunity for not just this as a regional property, but generally regional properties to be a place of employment. Mm -hmm. I think if you set someone the task of making it financially sustainable, I mean, you know, if that's how with many bus tours or whatever coming through, they would make it happen. And I think that's a, that's a huge um, untapped potential generally with regional museums. Mm. There is just only so far you can ever take it in a volunteer capacity. People have other things in their lives, work and family, mm. etc., that will take them elsewhere. So. And the passion and the goodwill is is there in a, in a great degree, but everyone can get tired. And, mm. um, and I think there's just been some little inklings of it recently that it just feels like it's time. We're ready for the We're next ready stage. For the next stage. <laughs> so we're working on that. Well, thanks very much for having us here today, and you are doing such great work, and I wish you all the best, and yeah, look forward to coming back and seeing that new stage.